שכן של קומות שלא הכרתי, נכנסת מבלי לחשב, וטיקטוקי הדמעות על הלחיים. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us from the United States and Israel and from around the world. Thank you for joining us for this second installment of an extremely timely and important three-part Judea and Samaria virtual mega event co-hosted by Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Zionist Organization of America. I'm Alan Jay, National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at the Zionist Organization of America. Not only is ZOA a tireless and powerful defender against all forms of anti-Semitism, we are proud that ZOA is the loudest and clearest voice defending the Jewish state of Israel's sovereign rights, which include Judea, Samaria, the Jordan Valley, and all of Jerusalem exclusively as Israel's capital. At our recent annual ZOA Superstar Gala, Prime Minister Bennett recognized the unique relationship between the state of Israel and ZOA when he said, just as you have our back, we have yours. Today's program, a cooperative effort of Yesha Council My Israel, One Israel Fund, Regavim, and ZOA, is entitled Guarding Area C, Dealing with the Danger of Illegal Arab Takeover of Judea and Samaria. Our host and moderator today will be the Director of International Operations at TPS News Agency, Miri Maoz Ovadia. Prior to joining TPS, Miri was an active spokesperson for both Yesha Council and the Binyamin Regional Council. Miri may be familiar to our ZOA audiences as she helped arrange and appeared in a wonderful ZOA webinar, a tour of ancient Shiloh, which can be found on our ZOA YouTube channel. As Director of International Relations at TPS, Miri leads VIP delegations and is responsible for foreign press and public relations in general. Miri, thank you for the complete body of your work on the front lines defending Israel's deniable legal, historical, and biblical right to sovereign inclusion of Judea and Samaria. And the program is yours. Miri, take over. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, Israel, and good morning, USA. Welcome to all of you who have joined us for the second Judea and Samaria virtual mega event. This huge conference has been organized in collaboration with the ZOA, My Israel, and the Yesha Council. The meeting today is also being held in collaboration with Regavim, NGO Monitor, and TPS, that's Pit Press Service. We're here with you together on Zoom, as well as on Facebook pages of the various organizations and on the YouTube channels of ZOA and the Esher Council. I'm very happy to be here with you today to moderate this session. My name is Miriam Ozovadia, as Alan introduced me, and I'm the Director of International Operations at TPS, Israel's independent news agency. At the previous meeting two weeks ago, we discussed the development challenges facing Judea and Samaria and the region's advantage as a major asset to the state of Israel. This session can be viewed on its entirety on the YouTube channel of the Yesha Council and the ZOA. We also highly recommend that you send the link to your friends so they too can learn, become familiar with the facts and stronger connect to the region. This is extremely important. We are also so excited that the Israeli government has decided to allow all tourists entrance Israel, starting from March. We would like to welcome you and make sure that, the, that you include a visit to Judea and Samaria in your next visit to Israel. At today's session, we will address the most significant issue currently facing the Jewish communities in Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley. Pres preserving Israeli territory, dealing with the very real danger posed by the illegal Arab takeover of the land in Judea and Samaria. The greatest challenge facing Judea and Samaria at present is the illegal takeover of land and land resources by the Palestinian Authority. This takeover is supported by funding and other assistance from European countries and left-wing organizations in complete violation of the Oslo Accords. The loose of the state land and the creation of facts on the ground represents one of the greatest dangers to Israeli communities and to the entire state of Israel. In this session, we will present the scope of the danger and the challenges, and we will also show how the Jewish communities are contending with this issue. Let's start the discussion of the subject right away. At the beginning of this session, we will hear greetings and remarks from Israel's ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan. Mayor of the Jordan Valley Regional Council and Chairman of the Yesha Council, David El-Khayani, Israel's Minister of Religious Affairs, Matan Kahana, 
and Rafi Lazarovitz of American Friends of Judea and Samaria. After the opening, we will hear some brief TED lectures on this topic from two women activists, the leaders of the sovereignty movement, Yehudit Katzover and Nadia Matar, and from the CEO of TPS news agency, Amot Eyal. This will be followed by a panel discussion with Naomi Linder Khan, director of Rigavim, Itai Reuveni, activist director of the NGO Monitor, and Uria Laberbom, a member of the Gush Etzion Regional Council. It is important to us and to the State of Israel that each of the participants here spread the information and details that will be discussed tonight, using all means of their disposal, public diplomacy, public activity, the media, social networks, and more. In this way, we can overcome ignorance and amplify the truth. So then, let's begin. I am honored to open today's meeting of Judea and Samaria virtual mega event with His Excellency, Israel Ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan. Good morning, everyone. I am pleased to deliver the opening remarks for this important event. I would like to thank the ZOA, the oldest Zionist organization in the United States, for fighting tirelessly to defend the Jewish people. I would also like to thank the Yesha Council and Israel Sheli for constantly defending the values of Zionism and strengthening the Jewish bond to Judea and Samaria. Thank you all for the critical work that you do. Friends, as Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, I spent every day battling the anti-Israel bias that is felt so strongly in the UN halls. I represent Israel before an institution that does not even recognize our right to any part of Judea and Samaria, the birthplace of our heritage. Each month, the UN Security Council dedicates a full debate to the Middle East. Yet, rather than focusing on the true threats to the region, such as Iran's nuclear program that endangers the entire world, it focuses on denouncing Israel. Maybe the most blatant example of the anti-Israel bias at the UN is that the UN Human Rights Council has used, or should I say abused, one-third of all of its inquiries to target and attack Israel. In fact, it has condemned Israel more than all of the times it condemned Iran, Syria, and North Korea combined. But like all of you here today, I am not deterred. I will never let our state be bullied or have our rights ignored. One of the key pillars of my strategy at the UN is to always go on the offense and to expose the lies and hypocrisy of our enemies. When the Human Rights Council released their annual anti-Semitic and biased report for 2021, I followed in the footsteps of Israel, Israel's legendary ambassador, Chaim Herzog, who refused to let the UN brand Zionism as racism. Like Ambassador Herzog, I tore up the annual report of lies on the General Assembly podium for all the world to see. While the Security Council dares to blame the democratic state of Israel for all of the region's problems, the f they fail to acknowledge the daily terror attacks that Israeli civilians suffer on the streets of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. So I showed them. I asked the members of the Security Council if they would consider it a terror attack if a rock like this was thrown at their car while driving with their children. This is the reality in Judea and Samaria. Rocks kill, but the UN did not understand this until I showed them. And this is the battle that I fight, but the war extends far beyond the walls of the UN. As ambassador, in every speech, before I discuss Israel's security priorities, I always emphasize our inalienable rights to the land. Jews are from Judea and no amount of lies or fabrications will change that. While countries at the UN call for negotiations and peaceful settlement, they support and fund 
the illegal Palestinian takeover of land in Area C. This is the deceit and hypocrisy that I work to expose at the UN. And this is why today's discussion is of such importance. Friends, in this week's parasha, we read about how Am Israel contributed so much to the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, that Moshe had to tell the people to stop giving. This, this same Mishkan stood in Shiloh, at the center of Samaria for close to 400 years. Just as every Jew understood that it was their responsibility to contribute, however they could, to the building of the Mishkan, so too it is our responsibility to fight for and defend the State of Israel in its entirety. When I served as Israel's ambassador to the United States, I further understood the integral role that American Jewry plays in defending the Jewish state. By taking part in this discussion, you are strengthening the bond between Jews abroad and Jews at home, fighting for the birthplace of the Jewish people. We are all fighting for the same cause, and I deeply appreciate your taking the time today to support such a critical initiative, and for this, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Erdan, for the important remarks. Ambassador Erdan previously served as Minister of Strategic Affairs and worked with the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria to effectively combat BDS and the lies spread about us. He has an in-depth knowledge of the area and the communities. Ambassador Erdan, we are so happy that you are with us at this important struggle. Yesha Council is the umbrella organization of the municipal authorities in Judea and Samaria. It deals with the development of the area for the sake of the future and engages in informative campaigns and other activities to push the Israeli government to promote the area and has collaborated in organizing this conference. David Al-Khayani is a farmer who lives in the Mushav Argaman in the Jordan Valley. David has been the head of the Jordan Valley Regional Council for 12 years, now in his third term. About two years ago, he was elected by the mayors of the local authorities to serve in another capacity as chairman of the Yesha Council. I would like to invite Mr. Al-Khayani to greet us from his offices in the Jordan Valley. Hello, friends and partners at DOA, my Israel, the Gavim, One Israel Found, the Sovereignty Movement, and to all those watching in the USA, good morning and thank you for joining us. Nowadays, we are in the midst of a war over the borders of the State of Israel. Most of you have probably not heard about it because it is a war that is being held quietly, out of the sight of anyone who does not live here in the area. But anyone who lives here and travels around Judea, Samaria and the Jordan Valley can see it clearly in his eyes. The dozens of bulldozers and workers who are illegally building unimpeded in Area C. Dear participants, in this moment, while you are viewing this conference, the Palestinians' bulldozers are hard at work. Based on the data we have, seven illegal Palestinian structures are built in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley every single day. In the last three years alone, more than 5,000 illegal buildings have been built in Area C. The Palestinians build illegally on Israel's state land, on land that is strategic value to the state of Israel, at the interest of Israeli communities, inside and on top of archaeological sites in nature reserves. <clears throat> For 10 years, the government ignored this, and now we found ourselves in a very troubling situation. 
Since I am as a head of Yeshat Council, I have decided to make this issue as my first and the most important priority. Today, we, the mayors of the authorities in Judea and Samaria, are doing what we can to help this illegal construction campaign. We have begun to hire land coordinators who are overseeing and mapping the area and helping in the field. We are working on the political level with the decision makers. We have requested that building permits be granted only if terror and the stealing of land are halted. In addition, we are currently launching a public campaign on the subject to mobilize the general public for this cues as well. If the situation does not change soon, we will lose control of the borders of the state of Israel, which will severely undermine Israel's security. Unfortunately, the media is busy reporting fake news coming from left-wing organization. Instead of actually coming out here to see what is happening on the ground with their own eyes, the Palestinians are completely undeterred from building illegally and no one is stopping them. This is at a time when Jews here cannot even put down a bench without permission to do so. Dear Pacifican, I thank you for joining us today. I thank you for joining today's conference and I hope that by its end you will have a better understanding of the real problem we are facing here in Judea, Samaria and the Jordan Valley and that you will be able to convey that knowledge further. Thank you, Mr. El Khayani. What you presented is extremely troubling and of course we'll be discussing that in depth later on this session. Minister of Religious Affairs Matan Kahana is a senior member of the coalition. He belongs to the Yamina party and is considered a close associate of Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Minister Kahana served in the Sayeret Matkal Commander Unit, also as a squadron commander in the Air Force, where he formulated his views on Israel's security. I'd like to call upon Minister Kahana to speak. To all our friends and partners at Yesha Council, ZOA, My Israel. Shalom lekol hamishtatfim beveidat Yesha, ani sameach ala izdamnut levarech etchem. Leorech shanim arukot, ketayas krav bechel haavir, yatsa li latus en sfor pahamim meal admot Yehuda vashamron. Mibchinati, kol tisa kazot aita itragshut gdola. Latus meal meharat hamakhpela, meal kever achel, meal bet el, meal kever yosef, meal mizbach yoshua. זה לטוס מעל המקומות שבהם אבותינו בנו את האומה שלנו, בנו את עם ישראל. אבל זה לא רק העניין של ההתרגשות הדתית לאומית, יש פה גם עניין ביטחוני מאוד משמעותי. מגובה שלושים אלף רגל, במטוס קרב, מאוד קל להבין עד כמה האדמות האלה חשובות לביטחון מדינת ישראל. אם יהודה ושומרון לוקח לחצות את המדינה בערך חמש דקות. חס ושלום בלי פחות מחצי דקה, ולכן לאדמות האלה יש חשיבות דתית, לאומית וגם ביטחונית. אנחנו נמצאים במאבק מתמשך על הזכות שלנו ליישב את נחלת אבותינו. לשמחתי, השנה הקרובה עומד להגיע המתיישב המיליון לאדמות ששוחררו במלחמת ששת הימים. מיליון יהודים יגורו ביהודה ושומרון ובשאר המקומות ששוחררו במלחמת ששת הימים. אני חושב שזה הישג מדהים להתיישבות היהודית. במבחן התוצאה, ההתיישבות ניצחה. גם הממשלה שלנו מחויבת למפעל ההתיישבות, ואנחנו נמשיך בהתיישבות ביהודה ושומרון. לאחרונה אושרו שלושת אלפים יחידות דיור ביהודה ושומרון, ואנחנו בעזרת השם נמשיך. לאורך השנים, מדינת ישראל לא נאבקה מספיק בנחישות נגד השתלטות של ערבים על אדמות מדינה ביהודה ושומרון. 
זה קרב שאסור לנו להפסיד בו, בדיוק מהשיקולים שציינתי קודם. אסור לנו לוותר על נחלת אבותינו, ואסור לנו לוותר על הנכס הביטחוני היקר הזה. אני מודה לכל חברי הוועידה על התמיכה במפעל החשוב הזה. תודה רבה. Thank you, Minister Matan Kahana. We consider the relationship between the Jewish communities in Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley, and our supporters around the world, and particularly our good friends in the USA, to be especially important. Rafi Lazarovich is a businessman from Brooklyn, New York, who in recent years has been volunteering his time and energy to help the Jewish communities of Judea and Samaria, and strengthen ties with our friends in the USA. This past November, Rafi organized a special delegation of business people that visited Israel. The delegation met with government ministers and Knesset members and conducted tours in the field in order to learn about the situation on the ground. I would like to ask Rafi to greet us and share his impressions of his visit here in Israel. Hello, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for taking the time to attend this important event. Much appreciation goes to the Yesha Council, ZOA, and My Israel for putting together this event and inviting me to be a part of it. I've had the pleasure of working closely with Yigal Dalmoni, CEO of the Yesha Council for the last three years. This work culminated this past October in a delegation of community leaders from Brooklyn, New York, traveling to Israel, wanting to learn more about the situation in Area C and Judea and Samaria at large. The delegation was spearheaded by the Yesha Council with the support of members of Knesset and ministers. We witnessed firsthand the issue of illegal Arab takeover of Jewish land and resources in Area C. We also learned of different ways the Yesha Council combats this problem on a daily basis through boots on the ground and lobbying in the Knesset. Upon returning, we decided we needed a help. So we formed American Friends of Judea and Samaria, an organization working in tandem with the Yesha Council to spread awareness in the United States on the issues facing Judea and Samaria today, as well as supporting various Yesha Council initiatives in Israel. It's been an honor to be involved with and see up close the work that the Yesha Council does. With God's help and the important work of the Yesha Council, ZOA and My Israel, we will hopefully soon see the success in guarding Area C and all of Judea and Samaria, our biblical homeland. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi, for your remarks, as well as for everything you've been doing for the people of Judea and Samaria, and I'm sure you'll be continuing doing this for many more years. It's now time to hear some of the TED Talks we've prepared for you. Yehudit Katzover and Nadia Matar are well known to almost everyone in Israel. They have been active for many years on behalf of Eretz Israel, leading women in green. And in recent years, they have been extremely active in the sovereignty movement, which they established. Yehudit and Nadia also established Oz Vigaon in Gush Etzion in memory of the three teen boys who were tragically kidnapped and murdered in the area, Gilad Shire, Naftali Frankel, and Eyal Ifrach. Yehudit and Nadia have been actively promoting the application of Israeli sovereignty over all of Judea and Samaria. We're going to ask them now to share with us their insights about the importance of safeguarding Israel's national land. Shalom, chavarim. אנחנו נמצאות כאן על דרך האבות בגוש עציון, בין חברון לבין ירושלים. על הדרך בעלו אבותינו לרגל שלוש פעמים בשנה. הנה אנו רואים מקווה מימי בית שני, אבן מיל מתקופת הרומאים, שמוכיחה שגם הרומאים המשיכו לצעוד על דרך האבות. לפנינו אלון שבות, אל עזר, מאחורי אפרת, לפניי ראש צורים. ובאמצע אתם רואים שטח ירוק פסטורלי של כמה מאות דונמים חשובים ביותר. אתם רואים שחלק גדול מהשטח מעובד ויש בו עצי זית וכפנים על אדמות המדינה שלנו. השטח הזה הנקרא נצר מאוד קריטי. אחד 
ליצירת רצף יהודי בין היישובים, שתיים, כעתודת קרקע להגדלת היישובים. After the destruction of Gush Katif in 2005, we began to see the area filling up with plots of lands cultivated by Arabs with signs from anti-Israeli organizations in Europe and the United States, such as USAID and Oxfam, proclaiming their assistance to the Arabs with millions of dollars of funding to enable the Arabs take over Israeli state lands. We immediately understood that there was an organized strategic plan of the Palestinian Authority to strangle Jewish settlement, to plant trees up to the gates of the Jewish communities in order to prevent them from expanding and to prevent continuity of Jewish settlement. We arrived and began to plant olive trees and grapevines to ensure that the area would remain in Jewish hands. We brought people, tractors and saplings and we planted on those lands. We presented a letter to the head of the regional council that we are planting on behalf of the people of Israel and that we have no ownership claim and often there were struggles on the ground between us and the Arabs. The Arabs didn't like the fact that Jews were preventing them from stealing Jewish land. The army arrived, the police, civil administration, we showed them all a map that indicated that we were working only on state land. The Arabs were removed from the area for that very moment, but they returned again and again and continued their illegal takeover of Israeli lands. Sadly, we saw that the IDF and the police treated us as if our presence in the area was temporary and that the Arabs were the locals. We succeeded in redeeming dozens of dunams here in Netzel and in other places in the area. But it's only a drop in the ocean of Judea and Samaria. The example of Netzel is a microcosm of what is happening in the macrocosm of all of Judea and Samaria. Throughout Judea and Samaria and all the area between the Jewish communities, The Arabs, funded by millions of dollars, are taking over our state lands by planting, building houses, excavating quarries. We sat and thought and came to the sad conclusion that Israeli control of Judea and Samaria over the course of 53 years without the application of sovereignty resulted in a situation where it is unclear to who Judea and Samaria belongs. As long as there is no decision by the Israeli government to apply sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, the world will continue to view us as occupiers. In 2011, we established the sovereignty movement and launched a massive campaign of conferences, parliament meetings, journals, political lobbying, media, and the establishment of the sovereignty youth. The application of sovereignty will make it clear to the entire world that our presence here is not temporary, that the Jewish people has returned to its homeland forever. We must also understand that there is a direct connection between the application of sovereignty in Judea and Samaria and what is happening in the rest of the country. Failure to apply sovereignty in Judea and Samaria transmits a message of weakness. The Arabs exploit it and this is what has led to the loss of the Negev, Galil, the mixed cities and creates great unrest in Jerusalem. A country that leaves a government in vacuum should not be surprised when it spreads to the entire country. Today with the current government, the situation is even more severe with two-thirds of the government left-wing and Arab. However, precisely now, if we want to save not only Judea and Samaria, but all of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, precisely now we must raise the banner of sovereignty even higher. If the right wing doesn't present a program of its own, we will find ourselves returning, God forbid, to the dangerous ideas of the two-state solution or of one state for two nations, which is new, the latest trend among the progressive. The public must understand that if there is no Jewish sovereignty between the sea and the Jordan, In Elon More, Shiloh, Betel, Hebron, and Gush Etzion, there will be no sovereignty and no governance in Ramle, Lod, Yafe, Be'er Sheva, or Tel Aviv. True, the Abraham Accords and this current government with a left-wing majority and Arabs give the impression that the application of sovereignty is not relevant at the moment. But, like 11 years ago, when we started the sovereignty campaign, people thought it was delusional, and together with many others, we succeeded in bringing it to Washington even. Today, sovereignty is needed even more, and thus cannot be dropped from the agenda. We must say loud and clear, the land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel. And please God, together we will act and succeed. Thank you, Yehudit and Nadia, for not only talking, but for really being committed and being so active in all aspects of guarding the sovereignty and guarding Judea and Samaria state land. Bias and anti-Israel media creates and fuels anti-Israel and anti-Semitic anti discourse around the world. The only way to change this phenomenon is to alter the media's discourse about Israel by providing accurate and credible news materials from the scene to tens of thousands of media outlets worldwide. 
TPS, Israel's independent news agency, is proactively leading this change by utilizing a network of almost 400 volunteer strangers located all over the country. TPS is the first one on the scene documenting all incidents and events. The agency brings factual evidence and distributes information to local and international media outlets. It is the only Israeli source of news presenting a professional alternative to the veteran global news agencies, such as Reuters and AP. In addition to the real-time news and special investigative pieces, TPS also covers a wide range of daily topics, economics, security, politics, technology, scientific developments, agriculture, human stories, and more. I would like to invite the CEO of TPS, Amot Eyal, to give us a TED talk on how the media covers Area C and how each and every one of you can help on this matter. Thank you, Miri. Thank you, ZOA, Yesha Council, and my Israel for having me today. When we are coming and try to understand the media coverage of Area C, first of all, we need to understand how the media works. And one of the most interesting facts is that today 93% of the world information are coming from news agencies for not from the newspaper that they read from someone that provide him his, the content uh, if you will go for example read your own newspaper uh, USA Today, Boston Globe, uh, Chicago Star or any other newspaper you will see in the international section that most of the article will, ca will came either from AP Associated Press, from Reuters, from AFP, the French news agency. They are providing the story from foreign countries. Now, what happens inside Israel? Inside Israel, you add a huge vacuum. You add the international news agencies, the big one, AP, Reuters and AFP. And you have a nine Palestinian news agencies that are providing pictures, videos and articles to media outlets all over the world from Israel but all came with a foreign uh, point of view with lack of understanding and what lack of will to understand the real picture of what happening every day on the ground that's what happened also when they are coming to cover the area C subject they are covering it in a narrow angle about uh, with certain point of view and they're trying to to take the uh, pictures that they are believing it or the story that they are believing it and deliver it worldwide. Uh, the problem here, they are the, the whole story and the whole Israeli story and the Israeli perspective and you know what, also the fact are missing from the stories. Uh, we see it in a lot of uh, events on the ground. For, for example, when you are coming to uh, cover the East Jerusalem story. You need to understand that the PA is standing behind a lot of money, a lot of effort to take over the control uh, about the land there, about the area. You can see in the story of um, um, the South Hebron Hill, you had a huge uh, clashes there between Jews and Palestinians in a certain village. Now all the coverage was focusing on this event. But no one uh, put attention that the uh, Palestinian Authority build an office in Area C there in order to support the Palestinians there to take over the, the land from Israel. And you'll see in Khan al Ahmar, for example, you will see the Palestinian Authority is standing behind and supporting them to build more. And when the residents of Khan al Ahmar they want to move to another place, the Palestinian Authority uh, threatening them not to move and not to change their location because they are blocking with uh, uh, the road from, they're trying to cut the road from uh, Jerusalem to the Dead Sea. And it's all planned and it's all coming with the reason. So when you as a journal journalist need to explain to the reader in the end what happening in the field, First of all, you need to understand that. And then you need also to talk and to understand, to understand the language, to understand what's behind the words. And in Israel today, we are the only Israeli news agency that providing the material from the Israeli eyes, from the Israeli perspective. 
we have photographers going to C to area C and to area B to take to take pictures and take uh, document what happening there in a wide perspective. We have investigator uh, journalists, investigative journalists. They checking what behind it, who's bringing the money. Uh, we getting a lot of information from other organizations like uh, uh, NGO Monitor, Gavim that sp speak here today. But it's also uh, journalist work to check the fact to make sure that the full picture and the whole story are delivered to the reader that are not in the field and if you will leave it and you will give just the opportunity just to foreign agencies to send their material you will see just one side of the story and you know what not the factual side we are here to take picture to document to invest and to write about what really happening in the field. Now the story here are ju is just beginning. The Palestinian Authority putting a lot of money and effort together with the European Union to take over Area C. We are here to make sure that everyone will see the truth here. They will see the full picture with the understanding of history and with uh, ability to understand where we're going here and what will be the future of this fight. I want to thank again to everyone that joined us today, to Maya Israel, to ZAO, and to Yesha Consul for putting really important spotlight on this subject today. Thank you. Thank you, Amots. I might add that I myself started working with TPS just a few months ago, and I feel very honored to be part, to be part of such an important organization, uh, which is really trying really, really hard to impact worldwide coverage of Israel. Let's move on now to a panel discussion of professionals. To introduce the discussion, we will screen a brief video about this very serious phenomenon. very troubling movie and in order to continue I'm going to introduce our three speakers for today. Our first, first speaker is Naomi Linda Khan. She heads the Regavim International Department and is in charge of the organization's foreign relations and international communications. She closely monitors the intervention of foreign governments and organizations in what is happening on the ground in Judea and Samaria. Her fields of responsibility also include monitoring bias false and hostile media coverage, and reporting of policy and law enforcement in Judea and Samaria, presenting the true facts to journalists, diplomats, and opinion leaders from around the world. Naomi will give us a brief overview of the situation and the data regarding the illegal Arab takeovers of Area C. Itai Rouveni manages the communication department of NGO Monitor. NGO Monitor provides information and analysis, promotes accountability, and supports discussion on the reports and activities of NGOs, claiming to advance human rights and humanitarian agendas. Itai will discuss the money behind the illegal building in Area C. The raid corresponds to the big European strategy and the reasons of this policy. Uriah Loberbom is a member of Gush Etzion Regional Council and is in charge of conserving the land of Gush Etzion. We will hear from Uriah about the situation on the ground after years of neglection, the changes that the Regional Council is leading, and how the residents are involved in this process. I would like to first start with Naomi. Naomi is going to share her screen with us, and I would also want to refer to you the first question. Yes, I'm with you. So great to have you here, Naomi. Thank you for having me. It's a very, very important event. Indeed it is. 
So obviously, Naomi, your organization is extremely important and plays a key, key role in this whole subject. Um, your organization has been monitoring this troubling phenomenon for many, many years. What can you tell us about the current situation? I'm having trouble with my share screen. Excuse me one moment. <laughs> Here we are. No, wrong. Sorry. Um, yes, well, I'd like to give some, uh, some background that will um, illustrate ex uh, some of the things that have already been said. Um, we, Rigavim uh, is a field-based organization. So we start from the ground up and we uh, collect data, hard data, uh, uh, that draws the picture of exactly what's happening. After that, we take a step back and try to figure out what to do about it. Uh, but I wanna give the audience a little bit of a background so that we can all be on the same page when we discuss um, in the panel moving forward. So this is a, a map of Judea and Samaria. The total area of Judea and Samaria is approximately 6 million dunams, which is just over 2,260 square miles. That's everything. Uh, the, the, the ASO framework divided this area up between areas A, B, and C. A and B placed under Palestine, full Palestinian uh, civilian um, jurisdiction at the time is uh, just over two and a quarter million uh, square dunams. And area C, the remainder, is somewhere in the area of, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, about three and a half million dunams. Of that area, only approximately 848 square miles are viable, meaning uh, areas that are not uh, either IDF uh, training grounds or nature reserves, so we're talking about an available area for construction of just over nearly 850 square miles. Now, what you see here in this image is the map of all Jewish settlement in Judea and Samaria. The entire thing uh, takes up all the green dots. So all the new noise that you hear uh, in international press about is, is Israeli settlement and Israeli expansion, et cetera, et cetera, takes up less than 1% of the total area of Judea and Samaria. Uh, taken as a percentage of area C, which is the area placed under full Israeli jurisdiction, it's less than 2%. So we're talking about a very, very small amount of uh, space that's taken up by Jewish settlement. So what we're here to talk about today is the other side of this coin. What's happening in the area, area C, the area placed under full Israeli jurisdiction, uh, and this is what it looks like. This is what it looked like in 2009 when the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority launched the plan, the official Palestinian Authority plan, which is supported by the European Union and international governments and organizations to create a unilaterally create a Palestinian state in area C. At the time, in 2009, there were nearly 30,000 illegal structures in Judea and Samaria. Once that plan, known as the Fayyad Plan, was launched, over the following decade, by 2019, that's what the map of illegal construction looked like. We mapped out each and every structure and we counted them. There were nearly 58 and a half thousand illegal structures in 2019, more than double the number that had been created in the years until 2009. Unfortunately, in the past two years, the situation has gotten far worse. This is what it looks like at the beginning of 2021. There are 72,274 illegal structures in area C. Now, it's not only the problem of how many illegal structures have been built, it's also the problem of where they've been built. They've been built strategically. If you look closely at the map, you'll see that they are engineered, they are designed, they are planned, and they are constructed to connect blocks of areas A and B, to create a block of Palestinian Authority control, uh, strategically connect these blocks, uh, the, the pink blocks that are under Palestinian Authority control, and to cut off, to surround and strangle and strangle 
the Jewish communities in green. Uh, this is a, a massive strategic failure, a failure of the Israeli governments for the past many years to identify the problem, to face the problem, to admit that there's a problem. Finally, around two years ago, uh, due to our pushing and pushing and pushing of this issue, the Israeli government began to talk about the battle for Area C and began to uh, relate to the situation on the ground really as a quiet war. But the war is not only um, this illegal construction. We have identified and written about extensively, written about three different kinds of three tactics of Israeli, of uh, excuse me, of Palestinian annexation of areas under Israeli control in areas uh, in Judea and Samaria in Area C. The first is this illegal construction. The second is uh, I don't have it here. I apologize. Um, I'll show you another slide. The, the second is uh, agricultural. Um, an agricultural uh, uh, takeover of land that is made possible by a loophole in the law that uh, um, is made possible by the fact that the state of Israel did not uh, extend Israeli law to the, this area. So what you see here in purple, if you can, if you can identify it, um, around all of these uh, blocks, there's also agricultural takeover of land. And uh, the third is something which we cannot show you on paper, but you can see for yourself if you go onto the internet, and that is the creation of an official Palestinian Authority land registry, where the state of Israel has not surveyed and registered state land since 1967. Um, the, the Palestinian Authority is going actively about their business, surveying and registering to its ownership land all through Judea and Samaria, including land that is part of existing Jewish communities. So these three tactics are actually changing the map of Judea and Samaria. How much are they changing the map? We've actually measured this. Uh, construction has taken over 95,200 dunams of land. Um, agricultural takeover is far worse. It's taken over 308,161 dunams of land. Uh, altogether, we're talking about over 400,000 dunams of land. That's around 10,000 acres or 156 square miles. That's about 18% of Area C already lost to these three tactics of construction, agricultural takeovers, and uh, that doesn't even include the land registry problem. So physically on the ground, the, the, the numbers are massive. The problem is unaddressed. And the state of Israel is, the, the government of Israel is essentially asleep at the wheel. No, I mean, just to ask you, all this that you're presenting, mm -hmm. must be a lot of money that's put into it. Perhaps Itai, can you explain to us where does the money of all this come from? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me today. And I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you. Good. So uh, yeah, the, the money question is a, is a, it's a huge question. And I will, I will discuss on number of points and then, uh, uh, then we, can far, we can expand the discussion. So basically it's not only, first of all, it's not only Europe, European countries, the EU itself, Canada, US, Australia, China, Japan, uh, the Gulf countries are heavily invested on development projects in the Palestinian Authority itself, in Area C, and in East Jerusalem. It can be uh, humanitarian buildings, it can be health, water, agriculture, like uh, what was mentioned. We're talking about huge sums of money. It's not a million dollar grant. It, it's, it's hundreds of millions that going through a vast network of NGOs, both international and local, in order uh, to, uh, what they perceive, what the world perceive, uh, is supposed to be the pillar of a viable Palestinian state in the future, all over uh, Judea and Samaria. Now, the problem is 
that huge amount of this money is not going to uh, assistance or humanitarian help, but being, being used both by the donors countries and the Palestinians to, uh, uh, for a kind of a political warfare. In that case, we have uh, the, the, the war on Area C. It's very similar that money that going to human rights organizations being used to promote anti-Semitism, apartheid slurs, BDS. So in the same, in the same way, money that going to development is being used and not by mistake in order uh, to create a de facto Palestinian state while bypassing all the agreements with Israel, including the Oslo Accords that uh, European themselves uh, signed on, on, the, on the agreements. Therefore, I will claim that it's not illegal Palestinian building, it's illegal Western building. The, Palestinian may, the Palestinians may um, physically build and maybe geographically choose the locations, you know, in the micro level, but the funding, the strategy, the timing, uh, the uh, laying out the diplomatic options in order to do such a project, it's all show by European governments, UN agencies and international NGOs. Now, let me share something. Uh, I will say something and then I will share uh, uh, two slides. One, it is, this, this is very important to, to understand. The money, most of the money is not about the building itself. It's not about the, the physical building of a school or a wall or tent. That's actually not a lot of money. This huge project that was mentioned here before, most of the money going to create the mechanisms to pay to the NGOs, to the employees, to the activists, to do mapping services in a very professional level, choosing the locations, the strategic locations, finding the ownerships. And for example, we know about a, a, a German grant uh, together with Palestinian NGOs in order to go to Turkey and find, uh, uh, go to the archives and find the Palestinian owners of this land wait for, let's say for 200, 300, 400 years ago. It include money for, to, to do lobby in the UN, in the US, in the EU. It's getting the building materials, doing PR, doing media campaigns, uh, uh, social media campaigns on each uh, 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 building that being uh, uh, demolished or being built. This is the real money. And we need to understand that. This is the first point. The second point, and I will uh, share now two quick slides with your permission. Yeah, we'll skip about and your monitor. The second point is the lack of transparency. Something we found out that each time that you want to receive from the donors countries, our friends, Europe, you know, the Netherlands, Germany, the UK, each time you want to receive information about what they do and how they do it in area C, everything is being erased. You can see two examples on your screen. One is from the UK, the other is from the Dutch government, all based on freedom of information requests. Everything in the, in the Dutch case, it was very extreme. They just blurred everything. This is all an agriculture building project uh, in area C, everything was just scrubbed out and in the uk you can uh, maybe not in this resolution but you can say that they just uh, hiding the names of the ngos that receive the money now when we ask the dutch government for example so they said black and white they said we don't want to share this information with the israelis because they will demolish and this is our project and we spent a lot of money so this is the second point the lack of transparency the third point, which is very unique, and it's a continuation of somewhat the first point of like every, uh, uh, that it's uh, uh, the macro level. After they build, they spend a lot of money to make sure that Israel will not demolish. And that's a very unique project that I will present in 90 seconds. 
Basically, the Europeans, mainly the UK, EU, and Norway, together with uh, small grants from other countries, paying an international NGO called the Norwegian Refugee Council to coordinate with the Palestinian Authority and local NGOs all the legal cases of Palestinians in Israeli courts against uh, home demolitions or building demolitions in Area C in East Jerusalem. We're talking about more than $8 million per year specifically to flood the Israeli court system with endless petitions. And we have documents, we have documents from, we have contracts with the government that the government's uh, coordinating and telling those NGOs what are the exact locations, what are the exact cases they want to bring to the court in order to, uh, to um, push the Israeli government to press and, 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 and press the Israeli policy, to change the Israeli policy. They're saying it's, it's a low visibility project because we understand that countries cannot do it to each other, so we will do it via some NGOs. And this, this is going on for years now, and uh, it's a big problem for Israel that uh, hasn't been addressed for, for years. So if I sum up in one sentence, when you, look, when you look on the funding, it's not only the numbers, but it's also how the mechanisms, how the money is flowing from the planning, from the planning um, step through executing this and also making sure Israel cannot touch those buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Itai. Before I move on to Uria, I see three of our viewers are asking uh, the same question, which really trying to understand how, why is the government of Israel neglecting and even ignoring this issue if it's so critical? It's just outstanding. So, do you want me to respond, Uria? So, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start. If uh, sorry about my English, not my uh, first language. Um, apologize, all good. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about what happened four years ago in uh, Moatza Gush Etzion, and I want you to understand all the people that talked before me, Naomi and Itai and everybody. We work together because all the information that we got from this organization help us to understand exactly what happened on the field when we go through Yeshuv to Yeshuv and uh, what happened out of the fence. Uh, I'm gonna share, uh, um, let me share one second. Just reminding that Uriah lives in a community called Sde Boaz in Gush Etzion. This is Yeshuv that we made uh, 20 years ago, a new Yeshuv, Yeshvut Seira, what we call Yeshvut Seira. I'm the chairman of the organization of the Yeshvut Seira too. Uh, we got uh, a lot of Yeshuvim that not, uh, they call it not illegal, but they legal, but uh, they not become a issue yet because of the government. And this is a part of the answer I'm going to give about the government, what they do and what we start to do in, uh, in Gush Etzion. What so we see here to, around... Just to make it clear, Sdeboaz is a young community established over 20 years ago, families still waiting for the government of Israel to authorize your community. Exactly. Uh, so what you see here is a map of uh, Gush Etzion and uh, Hebron, okay? And uh, what we see here in red, it's all the areas that the Arabs, uh, and I call it Arabs, sorry about, uh, I'm not gonna be, I'm not a politician, so I can say what, what I think. All the Arabs are the same. The Palestinian Authority is a patent, okay, that become 70 years ago to make money to a lot of people who live in Dubai, and the people that live in Bethlehem, Hebron, and all this area, uh, sometimes are, uh, I said it, uh, in jail, okay, of the Palestinian Authority, and you're going to understand it later, but they're working for them to make more money that Itai talk about it, and uh, Naomi shows their plans, and, and they don't want any Jew to live in uh, Judea and Samaria, okay? This is a true on the table. It's not, the, what we see here, it's a start of the, of the plan that they want to do the same thing like they made in Gaza in the Gerush and take all the Jewish out of, uh, of, of the area. What you see in red is the Arabs area. In the blue, it's our Yishuvim. You need to understand, Efrat, this area, you got Efrat, Alon Shvut, Faret Sion, all the, all the villages that 
uh, in 48 uh, and before 48 uh, was established. And what you're gonna see now, and you need to understand what Naomi said in, in all the details I give you, and uh, we collect together with, uh, with Regavim, is all the areas that the Arabs now start to build. I promise you in area A and B, you're not, you're not gonna see the amount of buildings that you're gonna see around area C. Why? Because they want to do all the connection, one land, to red land, that's gonna make uh, trouble to the uh, Israeli uh, uh, Yeshuvim to, to be established and uh, to go forward. Uh, what I want to say about uh, the, the, the strategic thing. So five years ago, when we elected to, to be uh, the, in the manager of the Gush Etzion, uh, say, we understand that we're not going to see your question. We're not going to see the solution with the IDF and the parts that work in the field right now. And we're not against them, of course, but we want to help them. Okay, so we made in Gush Etzion uh, uh, we made a, a section only to this uh, thing. And we put five workers that they work is to find all the illegal construction, agriculture, and all the things that the Arabs around us want to do to take the land of Israel. A, a department that work only on this and give all the information to the IDF. After we did this and we gave all the information, we, we understand from what we have details from Naomi and, uh, and uh, Regavim and all that the Arabs have plans that they send to the IDF, it's illegal plans, okay? They send them as, yeah, we know we want only to go to this area. And the strategic in the field that they start to do the plan, you're gonna see it in red, and then you're gonna see all the, the black spot is illegal uh, construction that they do in the last uh, year and a half. And this, and they're working dunam by dunam with a lot of money more than $100 million a year that come into our area to take all the land with agriculture, with uh, construction and everything. And because we're gonna talk about it in the panel, I'm gonna do it short. And I want to say, don't worry, okay? I want, because it's, the picture is bad right now, but I want to tell you we are here and we're working hard. One of our, uh, my project, we call it out of the fence because the uh, settlements of uh, the Israeli have fence around them and they're not feeling, we are not feeling home and this is our land. This is our home and we need to feel at home when you go out of the fence. So what we do, we do a project to do. This is the area you need to understand. Down here, this is Brechot Shlomo. Okay, Brechot Shlomo, the water, the water that brought the, 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 the water to uh, the, the Beta Mikdash uh, that someone uh, built and the Romans built uh, to do it. So we Is go that out of the aqueduct that brought water to uh, Temple Mountain. Thank you, Miri. And what we do, we use the same thing. We're going out of the fence. We do a lot of plantings, a lot of places that people can go out and travel in our land. We're not, in the end of the, my conversation, I want to say, don't forget, this is Israel, nothing else. Don't let anyone say anything else. This is our land and we need to be there. Thank you. I want to include some questions from our viewers, from our participants. Thank you for sending in questions. There's so many, we really try and touch as many as we can. Um, oh, it's obvious that the Arabs are working really hard to build as much as possible everywhere. It's a bit scary. Um, why aren't the Israeli communities building more? Why are they so small? This is one of the questions that came in. Can I address that briefly? Yeah. Um, we, one of the things that Regavin has been saying for many years since our, since, since the movement was founded 16 years ago is there's only one thing worse than non-enforcement of the law. And that is, uh, prejudicial enforcement of the law. When someone builds something without a permit in the Jewish sector, that could be even um, a patio in their garden inside of an legal recognized Jewish community, if they build without a permit, it will be demolished and it will be demolished quickly. 
and the person who built it without a permit will be fined. There will be sanctions. Uh, when this happens in the Arab sector, this doesn't. Th there is no law enforcement. The the rate of enforcement, and you'll hear about all, you know the international outcry about demolitions and the percentage of things that are built uh, as compared to the percentage of things that the Israeli government, which is fully within its rights to do so, actually tears down is minuscule. Uh, the, the, the percentages are laughable. And uh, when the state of Israel finally does get around to demolishing something, and this is generally after years of legal battles, lawfare is what we call this, um, and actually pulls something down, you have a situation like we've had recently where European governments actually threaten to sue the state of Israel and to bring the state of Israel up on war crimes charges for enforcing the law. Now, the state of Israel really shouldn't be afraid of all these things because there's nothing to it. The, the state of Israel has every right to enforce the law in areas under its jurisdiction under international law, but you can see the amount of outcry that happens when they knock down a, a shed, a pen for animals that was built illegally in the, uh, in the Arab sector, you'll have a tremendous international outcry. And the state of Israel simply wants quiet. It wants quiet and it buys off that quiet in the present by selling off our future. And that is a tragedy in the making. That is what we see all through Judea and Samaria. Pushing the problem down the line for someone else to deal with makes the problem bigger, deeper, wider, and much more intractable. Um, the state of Israel has the tools, has the legal tools, has the moral responsibility uh, under international law and any other kind of law that you, want, that you want to bring into the picture. The state of Israel has what it takes to enforce the law and to stop the loss of our national resources in Judea and Samaria, but is afraid to use them. Uh, it's time that with everyone who's watching today and everyone else who should be watching, it's time uh, for the Israeli government to get the message that voters, supporters, Jews all over the world will support a government that does what it's supposed to do. And that is to protect our national interests. So that's- Our worst enemy, our worst enemy, our worst enemy yeah. is ourself. Okay, when uh, Matan Khanna says that we're mil one million people in the Yudavish Shamron, we're supposed to be already four million. Okay, and our, uh, I don't think in other city in Israel, uh, somebody needs to ask to build the 100 uh, houses or something like this. We need to stop to be the only uh, thing that stop us to build in Judea and Samaria. It's ourself, okay, and the American government, because I saw a question how you can help. You need to understand that the government in the state stop, you need to stop to say to the government in Israel, don't build in your own country. I don't know other place that it's been like this. So the only enemy of ourselves to build and why it's so small because of ourself. We need to start build and we need to, to explain to the government that it's our ally, a big ally, good friend, the people in America, uh, we love them, okay, but they need to understand that we need to build more houses in Judea and Samaria and not stop ourselves. So I, I also pointed at that question, which was thanking all of you for an excellent presentation and wondering how our American friends can help, because obviously a lot of what's happening is happening over here. Um, but obviously, since there's a silent war, not so silent, who's going to own or take over more land and who's the present? I think what uh, friends overseas can help with is whenever you're here and it's possible to organize planting trees, supporting uh, the building of new Israeli construction, supporting new places like Sde Boaz, new-ish, but still places that obviously need to expand and the more they expand, the less the Arabs nearby will be able to, ex to expand to those areas. I think that's possibly very, very helpful. Um, I want to bring in another question. Um, Itai, you wanted to say something just before? Um, maybe we should discuss about why friendly countries are doing it to, to Israel, only if we have time. Uh, we do have, we have a few minutes actually before we, uh, we end the panel. So um, if you want to uh, relate to it uh, shortly. Yeah, very shortly. So okay. it, it's, it's, um, it's actually 
a good question if you look at in the you know in the global level uh, every lecture i did in the, in the last decade always someone in the end asked me asking me but why why friendly countries like you know the europeans or even something like the us and canada why are they doing it so very short uh, most of the people are screaming oh it's only because anti-semitism uh, anti but but it's not only this uh, it's splitted in my point of view to four different dimensions that correlates together first of all yes it's ideology it's there are, there is a deep anti-israeli sentiment in the humanitarian world and the donor countries sometimes also anti-semitic the second thing the palestinian project is an industry is a, is a, it's an industry full of billions of euros and dollars with hundreds of NGOs, employees, pension funds, events, tours, uh, funding mechanisms, bureaucrats. So many people are making money and careers from the Palestinian project that it's, it's impossible to stop this thing. Uh, the, the third one is the political beliefs of the West towards this conflict. They believe that only if this conflict will be solved all the other problems in the area and maybe also in their home will be solved also, which is pretty childish uh, assumption. Uh, the settlements are obstacle to peace. The Israelis doesn't know what good for them, so we will teach them what good for them. We must educate them, we must sell them human rights and, and et cetera. And we cannot criticize the Palestinians cause uh, they can be mad. And the last thing, it's something very obvious, every country in the world, every major country wants something to do with this area for centuries. And if you take all those four things and make them and, and, and correlate them together, you can, uh, you have a monster, you have a very good reason for the Europeans to uh, promote this illegal foothold in this tiny, tiny place called Judea and Samaria. Thank you. Thank you, Itai. I'm, I'm so glad that you added that. That's extremely important, what you just said. Um, as our time is almost uh, finishing, um, two of our participants were essentially asking the same thing. Is it a lost battle? Is like, We seem hopeful, but yet, can, can you give some good news to the people who, are, who have joined us today and really want to you know, see the situation going to a good place? Uh, let, me, let me address that since I am definitely the most senior uh, uh, of the people participating here today. Um, we've seen stranger things in our lifetimes and just before our lifetimes. Uh, the entire state of Israel um, was something that no one thought could exist. Um, our continued existence is certainly not to be taken for granted. Our success on every other field. It's a question of our own resolve. We have the tools, we have the know-how. All of these things can be corrected. Um, two out of the three situations that I, well, actually all three of the tactics that are used by the Palestinian Authority to annex uh, Area C and create the Palestinian state in Area C are things that we created by our own decisions. The government of Israel decided what the legal framework what would be in Judea and Samaria. And that was a completely, uh, self -imposed, these are self-imposed regulations. These are self-imposed uh, constraints. The same way we created them, we can uncreate them. We can change them. Uh, we have successes. Um, for example, the entire agricultural takeover of 300,000 uh, dunams of land in Area C, the only reason that that works is because we decided to continue to implement and to enforce Ottoman land law. Well, we can decide not to just as well. These are all things that are in our hands. Uh, we can decide not to subject, subjugate ourselves voluntarily. Um, this was a decision of the Israeli government, subjugating ourselves to the Fourth Geneva Convention and then allowing the rest of the world to misconstrue that, con that, that convention and apply it to us unfairly and uh, actually completely upside down. All of these things are within our power. We have to recognize our power. We have to use our power. We have to stay, obviously, 
within the constraints of the law, but we have to make sure that like any other government in the world, the government of the state of Israel knows what our national interest is and does what it has to do to protect our national interest. If it doesn't do that, it's not worthy of the name of the government of the state of Israel, and it is not protecting the interests of the Jewish people. It can be done. It can be done uh, with a little bit of resolve um, and a lot of courage, and that's what we need now. Oh, yeah. Oh, Itai, do you want to add any final remarks? Um, yeah, of course. Um, I'm going to bring uh, something from, I'm playing American football in Israel, it's a national team too, and in uh, teams that's called Judean Rebels. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we're still in the first quarter, nothing and We need to understand that uh, in 48, the war is not finished. We didn't finish to take our country back, all the country. Okay, and we have an enemy that want to take us, uh, us out. And if he was succeed in 48, he was finished the job. And we need to understand it. And we need to work. We need to start working and working offense, not defense anymore. We need to work offense. And we need to start to do exactly what Naomi said and more on the field to take the people out to our land and take it step by step and just need to work. The strategy of the, of the Palestinian Authority is working for them right now because we don't have, our government don't have the, the things that they want to accomplish in the Syria and all in Judea and Samaria. In the minute that they're going to say that this is our land, the way to finish this war is going to be very short. I'd just like Thank to add, know. there was a question in the chat. Someone said uh, this, this information should be translated into English and made available. Everything is in English. Uh, all this material is available in English. On Rigovim's website, we have massive studies of the problem and solutions. On NGO Monitor's website, all of the information about who's getting the money, where it's coming from and where it's going, it's all available in English. Uh, people, people need to know to look for it and share it. Uh, anyone who's interested in getting regular updates, both NGO Monitor, Rigavim, um, My Israel, I believe also, all of these ZOA, everyone sends out newsletters, sign up, go onto Rigavim's website, sign up for our newsletter, you'll get news, uh, you'll get news uh, straight into your inbox, you'll get uh, alerts about full new reports and mapping, all of these things are out there. Um, People need to know about them and share them as widely as possible. I want to add to that. First of all, of course, if you're overseas and not capable of visiting, so there's plenty of ways of staying in touch, following the websites, get signing onto newsletters, and I'm sure all three, all four of us are happy to also be available on further answering uh, questions that we didn't have the time to answer through this webinar. And also now that Israel is opening up again for tourists, uh, it's definitely, it could be a possibility for any of you who want to come and visit, whether if it's on private visits or official Yesha Council tours, if you want to come to the area, see the situation, see the places, um, all of that can definitely be arranged and your friendship, your involvement is extremely valuable for us. Uh, it's, that's why this is a, it's an issue that's relevant to all Jews all over the world and that's why we opened this up and this is not an, an Israeli seminar. And I also wanted just to answer about the hope, you know, that the, the tikva, the anthem says, so if the hope of the Jewish people is 2000 year old. So of course, we're not giving up on, we're not giving up on our hope and there's plenty of things to do. And uh, we definitely want to finish this on a positive note. Okay, I hope no one, <laughs> nobody here is coming out depressed. There's plenty of missions to, to be active on and we're going to be continuing to be active and work for real change. So on this note, I want to thank you really from the bottom of our hearts, Naomi, Itai, and Uriya. Thank you for leaving us educated and knowledgeable about this really, really important topic. I want to sum up this event, this webinar. Today, we learned a great deal and acquired tools and information that is often obscured from us. You can access, like we said, all this information is accessible in English on the organization's website, the Asia Council and the ZOA. And the question that repeated itself over and over again, um, this seminar is going to be recorded and you can uh, view it again and again, you can share it with friends. It's extremely important that what you heard today, don't keep it to yourselves, uh, share it with friends and try and see how you from wherever you are can act and help us bring to a change. 
Uh, beyond visiting our website and reading the materials, it's even more important to use this information. Everybody in the means that they have, whether if it's social media, like we said, people who have public relations, uh, who can act in the American government, of course, that's the way to bring for a change. Thank you for being with us for the second Judea and Sam uh, Samaria virtual mega event 2022. This session will be accessible to view, like I said, and to share on the YouTube channel, the Asia Council and the ZOA. In two weeks on March 6, at the same time, we will hold the third and last virtual mega event of the year. In that seminar, we will discuss the danger facing Israel's heritage, historical sites in Judea and Samaria. I'm just reminding you that it's important to register to the third seminar so you can get a link and join us. If you have not yet registered, make sure that the link will also appear at the end of this seminar. In the meantime, we wish you all Shavua Tov. We have already started thinking about the next year mega event, and hopefully next year we'll hold it face to face rather than over a computer. I was Miriam Ozovadia, and on behalf of the Esher Council, the ZOA, My Israel, and TPS News Agency, we wish you all a good week. I hope that we will soon be able to meet face to face here in Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley at our amazing nature and heritage sites with the stories of the Tanakh and of the courageous residents of Judea and Samaria communities who are really trying all they can to strengthen the hold of our ancestral heartland. Have a great day and goodbye. <laughs>